We're talking to you this weekend uh, about making room for life, and I feel like a lot of us don't feel like we have much room for life at all. And so we're going to talk to you about how the grace of God re releases the stress of life. And so we're just going to start by reading a passage of Scripture. I'm going to read you Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. It's going to come up on the screens. I'd love for you to just read this along with me. This is kind of the, the jumping off point for the talk that we're going to have this weekend. It's just this. And Jesus and his disciples were on their way. And he came to this village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was what? What was Martha? She was really distracted by all the preparations. Ever feel like that you have so much to do that you are distracted from paying attention to what's really going on? I think that's normal American life. She was distracted by all the preparations that had been made and she came to him and said, Lord, why don't you care about my sister? She left me to do all the work by myself. Tell her she has to help me. Eh, eh, I'm at so much to do. I'm so busy. What's wrong with you, God? Who's she blaming for all her busyness? She's blaming Jesus. How come you're not making her help me? Oh. Oh, we read this passage and we're like, oh, no, no, she's blaming the sister. No, 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 she's blaming Jesus or she would have talked to the sister. It's Jesus' fault I'm so busy. If he hadn't been in my house, I wouldn't have all this work to do. <laughs> Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all this work by myself? Tell her to help me. Jesus said, Martha, Martha. You are so worried and upset about many things. Doesn't that sound like the country we live in? But only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is, what's the next word? Mary has chosen what? Something better. Something better. And it will not be taken away from her. I want you to think for a second about your favorite vacation in your whole life, the best vacation you ever went on. I want you to turn to the person next to you at all of our campuses and tell them the favorite vacation you ever went on, go. Now that you have that thought of that beautiful vacation in your head, we're gonna pray and we're gonna have a conversation about rest, Jesus. I pray right now at all of our campuses that your presence would overshadow any distraction, that your power would overflow from me, not because I'm awesome, but because you're awesome. I ask right now that you'd speak through my voice, that you'd whisper hope, that you'd whisper encouragement, and that you'd whisper peace over every heart and over every life because you're the God of hope, you're the God of peace, you're the God of strength. And so this weekend, we lift you up and we walk out of here knowing that when we come to you, we will find rest. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Everybody said, Amen. you may be seated. I just want to ask you a question as we get rolling. What was your favorite place you ever went on vacation? Jamaica. Jamaica sounds like a good vacation, man. I like that. What else? Vegas. Vegas. That sounds all right. <laughs> Ten Tennessee. Yeah, we actually met in Tennessee. We did. We met in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Where else? Australia. Okay, Australia sounds awesome to me. That sounds like a good vacation. What else? Somebody said Wisconsin? Yeah. That doesn't sound like a vacation. <laughs> what else? Duluth is pretty. I like Duluth. What else? British Columbia. See, when I was a kid, my dad, one of my goals, my, one of the goals my dad had for me when we grew up was that he wanted us to visit uh, every, every state in the United States by the time I turned 18. So we went on vacation after vacation after vacation every summer. It just didn't make a difference if we had any money. We stayed in a tent. We did whatever it took, but we were going to visit everything. I've been on a lot of vacations over the course of my life. However, my favorite vacation, I have three. One was I took my kids to Idaho. We stayed at a ranch called the Diamond Tea Ranch. I'm shouting out to them, so if you want to look that up later on, that, that ranch was awesome. We stayed there for a week. That was ridiculously cool. Uh, the, Holland's right nodding her head. Yes, that was awesome. I caught a lot of trout that week, too. That was good. Uh, one, of the, one of my favorite vacations is when Kelly and I first got married. Uh, we worked for a, a baseball card company and they used to send us to players' homes to sign cards. 
I'm not even kidding. So I, I met like a lot of rookies, like growing, like when we were first in college. And so when we were first married, so we go to these players' houses and they sign cards. That was a great vacation. I went all over like DC and Annapolis. We went up to Canada one time. I know Canada, but we went to Montreal one time and said, just, we've, I've been a lot of places. You know what happens every time you go on vacation? Think about vacation. When you're on it, you're thinking like this, man, I never want to stop this. Oh, why can't my life just feel like this? Oh, it's like my favorite vacation of all, though, is I, t- I, I had an all-inclusive in, in Cancun. My wife and I, anybody ever gone to an all-inclusive? Put your hands up. Oh, that is a once-in-a-lifetime experience. I've only been there once. But we got this all-inclusive in Cancun, and I laid on the beach for a week, and they brought me whatever I wanted. Oh, it was awesome. And we got on the plane at the end of our week. And I'm guessing that you probably did at the end of your vacation where there was a plane ride or a car ride home and you looked at your spouse or you looked at the person you're with and you're like, oh, how can we make our life more like this? What can we do to lessen the stress in our, who's had that conversation before? Come on, put your hands up. See, look at the number. Like most people at one point or another, when you've gone on vacation, you're coming home going, what are we gonna change? How can we have a little less stress in our life? How can we get a little more of this and a little less stress? Are you with me? Now, having said all that, the, 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 the problem is some of you are going, but I really like all, all of my workload. I like all of the things I have to do. I like all of my accomplishments because when I got home, I had this big list of all I had to do. And um, the reason why you like vacation at the same time is because you got so overworked, you needed it. So there's something about you that loves work but there's something else about you that loves rest. Do you know why we like work so much? I think we like the concept of work so much because we believe if we're busy, our life is better. If we're busy, our life is better. And I would actually question that thought for a second. What if at the cross, God was not trying to give you more work to do, but he was trying to relieve your workload? Would that be a nice thought? Come on, talk to me. Wouldn't it be nice if at the cross, what God was trying to do was give you a little bit more of this because he knew you were overstressed and overworked. And some of you are like, I'm not overworked. I'm not overstressed. Really, let's see if I can help you understand this for just a second. I did a whole bunch of research on Americans and our lives when it comes to workload. I'm gonna give you a couple thoughts. Many studies rank Americans number one in the Western world for overwork. Did you know that the average American worker works 200 to 500 more hours than, than Western Europe? 200 to 500 more hours a year. Do you know as a pastor, I'm talking to my kids and I'm like, honey, like kids, do you know that if you're not a pastor, you actually get two days off a week. I work six days a week. I work at least at a minimum 48 hours a week. Most people get two days off a week. I only get one. I get Friday. That's all I get. But Western Europe... Two to 500 hours less workload. Interesting. We rank most in work, but we also rank most in overscheduling. It's kind of interesting that you drop your kid off at the bus stop at 7.30 in the morning, and then he goes to school, and then you drive to work, and it takes you, some of you, 30 minutes, some of you, an hour to drive to work. You go and work for all eight hours, and then you don't have time to pick up your kids because you work, so they got off the bus by themselves, and they went home, and they kind of made themselves a snack, and then you drag your, your, yourself back into the driveway at the last possible second, and then you go, oh, yeah, she has ballet or he has soccer practice, or he's got football. So, oh, we don't have time for dinner. Everybody's up in the car. We're driving down the road and we got to pull into the fast food restaurant and we pull into McDonald's and say, here, stuff your face with this while we drive as fast as we can to make it to practice and then get out. I'll, I'll meet you in an hour. And then you go, you go try to find yourself something to do for your hour. Uh, and then you go pick them back up and then you drive home and you realize, oh no, we haven't done homework yet. All right, kids, sit down, let's do our homework. And we sit down and we start doing our homework at like 8.30 and then at 9.30 your homework is done and you go, oh my gosh, we forgot to give them, like you should try to take a shot before you go to bed. And so and then it's, not, it's, it's 10 o'clock, 10.30, 11 o'clock. And then you finally fall exhausted into bed and you start the whole routine over again. On the other hand, it, did, did you know that Western Europe, they get off and they go home and they eat dinner as a family and their minute, me, meal takes like two hours and they actually enjoy each other's company 
They sit around and have conversation. Then they just go to bed when they're tired. And they get up the next day and they work and they come home and they're a little more... Some of you are looking at me like, are you nuts? I've never heard of such a thing. That's normal for the rest of the world. We're the ones that are a little whacked. Not only are we overworked and overscheduled, but keep reading though. Let's put that back up again. Where'd that slide go? Oh, over electronic connectedness. It's kind of funny how much we spend. Like when you drive to work, what's on? Come on, talk to me. Uh, we're going to do a remedial class. Uh, when I ask you to speak, then you get to talk back. So, what's on in the car? How many of you listen to driving the car in silence? There's like eight of you. <laughs> Most of you? There's something on in the car. Radio's on in the car. And then when you, when you come home at night, the television is on, the iPod is in, the cell phone is out, and uh, there's a new, a new stat that many Americans are now watching TV while surfing the net at the same time on their phone. I have to tell my kids, put the phone down and just watch the show or play with the phone and turn the TV off. Because we're doing like eight things at once. We are overconnected. I went to a, a, a round table with a group of pastors the other day and we're sitting and I said, excuse me, I'll use the bathroom. So I went and we used the bathroom and I came back to the table and there's eight pastors, some of the names you would know, and we're sitting around this table and all of them, instead of talking to each other, are playing on Twitter with their cell phones while having a conversation with each other. None of them look at each other. They're all at the table, a whole table, all on their phone. Because we are overconnected. We think it's going to help our relationship if I play on Facebook all night. But does it really help your family relationships? I just, I'm just a, just a question. And how about, how about overspending? Do you know the average Amer- American spends 10% more than he makes? The average American has $400 to $500 in a savings account. That's all. That's it. Because we overspend. And let's not forget about over-consuming. According to one stat I read last week, it was kind of interesting. If everybody in the world consumed like Americans, if everybody lived at the level that Americans live, it would take four Earths to feed us. Four Earths. If seven billion people lived like us, it would take four Earths to sustain it. See, we are over-consuming, we're over-spending, we're over-connected, we're over-scheduled, we're overworked. but it's kind of interesting. We think, if I wear my busyness as a badge of honor, I will be better off, but it's also interesting that many Americans also rank number one in the Western world for anxiety, stress, loneliness, lack of sleep, anger, and violence. We have more people in prison than anybody in the modern world. Depression, unhappiness. Do you know that, that according to one stat I read, it says most American men have zero friends. They don't, they don't have one friend they could actually tell the real stuff going on in their life. But we have more Facebook. We got more Twitter. We got more time on the computer. We got more connectedness, but we are more lonely than ever before. Do you think these two might be related? Just a thought. Maybe God had something better for us than a badge of busy. See, when you're on vacation, you're thinking, I wish my life could be more like this. But when you get off vacation, we go back to crazy immediately. And we live in depression and anxiety and loneliness and we end up hating each other. And like, I, I, I believe much of the problems in our world are simply due to our over busy schedules and lives. Is this making sense? What I'm really saying is this. It's real important. I hope you write this down. A lack of space is going to equal a lack of grace. A lack of space is going to equal a lack of grace. The reason why you can't be kind is because you're late for work and they cut me off in traffic. But if you have time in your day, do you care if they cut you off in traffic? No. So what? So I'm going a little slower. What if? The difference is insane. It's so just like, let's go back to the story we just read. We heard the story of Mary and Martha. You've got Jesus visiting a home. 
Jesus visits Mary and Martha. Martha immediately goes, ah, God's visiting. I better clean up. I better get the table set. I better make the food right. I better get everything fixed and ready to go. It's gotta be perfect. And when it's not perfect, then she's frustrated. She looks at Jesus and says, Jesus, make her help me. Gosh. And then she looks at Mary and goes, she doesn't say it to him, say it to her, she just thinks it. Gosh, why doesn't she help me? I just, she never helps me around the house. She's living mad and miserable because she thinks she has to do her to-do list. What is she? Mad and miserable. Say mad and miserable. This is how most Americans live. We live mad and miserable. Because a lack of space equals a lack of... On the other hand, if you have time to rest, and then you get up from your place of rest and you get interrupted, don't you try to treat people well? Because you feel good inside. And you're kind of at peace, and you're not really so worried about the world because... You've had time to decompress and feel good about yourself and feel good about life a little bit as opposed to being so worked up and anxious. Are you hearing me? I'm going to give you a couple of thoughts. I want you to write them down. When we have no space in our lives, we get frustrated with Jesus. I think some of us get angry at God. I can remember, check it out. There have been times in the life of this church when I have been so busy, I have walked off the stage walked out in the back. I'm not even making it up. I walked out in the back and said, looked up at heaven and said, God, what are you doing to me? And I'm mad at God, like it's God's fault. <laughs> we get mad at God. We get mad at other people. And then I really believe the final result of all this is we never enjoy our lives. Because we always have one more thing to do, one more thing to accomplish, one more, one more soccer practice to take somebody to, one more thing to schedule, one more thing. I, I never have enough. I, like, it, we're always thinking I need more. And so we're always frustrated. I'm going to say it a different way. When we are busy, we don't have time for grace. When we finally do rest from all of our busyness, we're so tired we don't have the energy to hear God give people grace or feel good about ourselves. This is where it gets really important. See, when we're really busy, we don't give anybody grace. So then we're tired. We're, man, I'm so, so busy. I need a day off so you get home. I just need a day. Leave me alone. <gasps> and so then you lay down, and the neighbor started mowing his lawn. And that dog barked. And then I went for a walk. And then this happened, and that happened, and even when I'm just trying to have a little bit of alone time, everybody interrupts me. I'm being a little goofy, but I want you to catch the point. I think the reason why we, you come home from work after a long day, and, you're, and your kid goes, Daddy, can you read me a book? What do you want to do? Read the book? No, you want him to go play. Just go on. You can't give him grace because you got so busy that now you're too tired to give anyone grace. Do you think the dysfunction in America with our lack of respect towards each other and the lack of honor has anything to do with our lack of space? I think so. I think so. So here's the real question I want to address. What if Jesus and his gospel addressed our lack of space? I think he did. I think over and over again, this concept was addressed in the word of God. I'm gonna give you the verse we just read a second ago. This is Luke 10, 41 and 42. It says, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things. That sounds like most of us. We're worried and upset over how's that gonna work? What's gonna happen there? Well, how are we gonna pay for that? I just, I just I'm worried about many things but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is, what's the next word? What is Mary doing? Kind of nothing. <laughs> I know people were like, oh, it was a worship experience. <laughs> it looks to me like Jesus and Mary are in the backyard eating a bag of pretzels. <laughs> Hanging out with Jesus. She don't got a care in the world. 
We want to spiritualize this and make it like, oh, I bet she was learning the Bible. Isn't that just more work? Come on, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. See, what, what does religion do? It takes all of our to-do lists and then it adds more to do. Learn these verses, memorize this thing, attend this place, do this thing, and we just add more and more and more and more and more and more and more. Maybe the better was less. I'll give you some more passages of scripture about it. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30 says this. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you... Take my yoke upon me and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find. In other words, when I bump into Jesus, when I attend a church, when I worship Christ, when I am around the things of God, do I get more stressed out? No, I find more peace. I'm more relaxed. I don't feel like I have more to do. I feel like God's going to take care of it all. Are you hearing me? See, I like the way the message writes the same passage. The message Bible was written by Eugene Peterson and he just kind of wanted to update the language a little bit. He says this in Matthew 11, 28 to 30. And I love the verse. He says this, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? I love the fact that he says religion because this is many times we come to church and then we're more tired. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real what? Walk with me and work with me. I love this. Watch how I do it. In modern vernacular, watch how I do. Jesus in modern vernacular, I like that. Learn the unforced rhythms of. Notice that somehow grace is not forced. It's not stressful. It's not anxious. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn how to live Freely and when you're all stressed out, don't you feel heavy burdened? God goes, no, 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 I got something better for you than the busy schedule, than the overwork. I'll give you a third verse about it, and I like this verse a lot. We're gonna unpack this verse a little further. This is Hebrews chapter four, verses 10 and 11. It says this, for all who enter into God's rest, I'm gonna stop for a second, by entering God's rest, he's saying this, you've Ask Jesus Christ to forgive your sins and lead your life. It's salvation by grace. For all who enter into God's rest, you said, Jesus Christ, I believe you're God. I ask you to forgive me of my sins and free me. I want to enter into God's rest. I, I need your rest and peace to fill me. That's what you're asking, God, they're asking for. Are you with me? Okay, so for all who enter into God's rest or get, become a Christian, trust Jesus by faith, will find, what's the next word? From their labors. Wait. So when you become a Christian, you're supposed to find... So if you became a Christian and you ended up with more work to do, are you understanding God's grace? Huh, interesting. We'll find rest from their labors. Just as God rested after creating the world, let us do our best to enter that place of? Now he uses an interesting concept. He says, for as God rested after creating the world, God worked for six days and then took a day off. He goes, I work, 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 rest, right? Then he looked at us on the Ten Commandments in the law. This is the Old Testament law. In the law, it was, you got to work, 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 work. <sighs> you get a little rest. So in other words, this. The law was, ready? Rest one day, stress for six. That was God's rule. I want you to rest for one and go back to stress for six. And you rest for one, and then stress for six. But Jesus came along at the cross and said, wait, 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 wait. These people following this law are still ending up stressed out all the time. How about we abolish the law with the cross? How about we take away the work six and rest one, and how about we begin to live from a place of rest? that there was permanent rest for you, that you don't have to worry, you don't have to stress about your problems and struggles or your financial issue or your marriage issue or this issue or that issue, that at the cross, Christ conquered that stuff so that you could freely trust him and then take a break. This is faith right here. Faith is, I'm gonna go home 
you know what, I'm not gonna work anymore today. I'm gonna go home because God is gonna take care of that problem for me at work. I'm gonna hang out with my family. Faith is, you know what, I have done everything I know to do about that financial issue or that marriage issue or this, this issue or that. I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna trust you, God, to take care of it. I'm not gonna try harder. I'm gonna let you accomplish what I never could. Are you hearing me? I'm gonna say it a different way. Like some of you are going, some of you are going, Pastor Eric, is Jesus down on work? No, Jesus isn't down on work. Here's what I want you to understand. Jesus' idea was that we work from a place of rest. We don't rest from a place of work. That his idea was that we work from a place of rest. In other words, this, that after I have rested, is my brain more capable of dealing with my problems or less? It was so funny. People say this about themselves. Oh, I work better under pressure. <laughs> Do you know the truth is, is that you lose half of your mental capacity by being anxious, stressed out, and overworked? Your brain works half as hard due to the stress you're under. That you don't actually experience a better productivity by working more. You actually experience a worse productivity. That when you come at your work from a place of rest, you are refreshed, ready to go. You accomplish more than you ever could have if you just kept working. When I was first, when I was first married, uh, one of our, our, our guys on the board at the time, a board member goes, can I tell you something, Eric? Because you're working all the time. At that time, I was kind of a workaholic. Actually, I shouldn't say kind of. I was, to be honest. Okay, so he kept coming to me and said, uh, what do you think it's easier to chop down a tree, with a sharp axe or with a dull one? I'm probably a sharp one. He goes, okay, so let's say you're chopping wood all day long. All day long, you're like, oh, I gotta get more wood chopped. I gotta get more wood chopped. I gotta get more wood chopped. And you just keep hacking away all day. He said, I bet you would chop more wood if you would just stop every once in a while and sharpen your ax. You know that's true? If you would stop once in a while and sharpen your mind, sharpen your soul, just chillax a little bit, you would actually accomplish more than if you just keep working on your problem with that thing that you whispered into your hand earlier. That thing you want so bad to get it to go away and accomplish it. What if you just stopped working on it? You just ate a good meal. Read a book to your kids. Took a good long nap. See, at the cross, God wasn't just freeing you from your sin. He was freeing you from your labor. It's interesting that the curse of sin was you will work by the sweat of your brow, right? That's what scripture says in the book of, in the book of Genesis. But after the cross, the power of Christ infu was infused in you. God will get accomplished what he wants to get accomplished in your life if you would live in faith rather than living under law. So some of you, maybe you, I've even taught on Sabbath rest before. I said, you know what? You should work for six and rest one and work six and rest one. I'm gonna take it further than I've ever taken it before. That our lives are to be lived at a state of rest. You will help more people. You will be more grace-filled. You will give more money if you had more space in your finances. So your ability to actually contribute good to the world is directly tied to your space. To hear God, to hear your wife, to love your kids. Interruptions are no longer interruptions. You notice in the scripture, every time Jesus is going for a walk and somebody interrupts him, he, doesn't, he never goes, gosh, I was trying to go to there. Do you know what time it is? <laughs> and then he just stops has a conversation, joy spills out of him. So then he ends up at a dinner party and it's a wedding ceremony and they're all dancing and they're out of wine and he's like, hey, I got that. And out of his place of joy and rest, he brings wine to the party and everybody gets a glass. He's going to heal somebody in a Lady reaches over and she grabs the hem of his garment and she is instantaneously healed and he doesn't stop and say, who touched me? Who's interrupting? I gotta go heal somebody over there. He stops and he gives attention to this woman and he just blesses her and he's good to her and she walks away in joy 
And then he goes and he doesn't just heal somebody, he actually resurrects a dead person. See, I want you to understand that you will resurrect the people around you if you have space in your life to do so. I'm gonna say that again. You will resurrect the people around you if you have space in your life to do so. And if you have no space around you, you can't resurrect anyone. Are you hearing me? I'm gonna say it, I'm gonna say it one more way, and this is not gonna come on the PowerPoint either. I just, I just feel like I'm, I need to say this, and this is really important. Okay, check it out. When you work, are you hearing me? When you work, God rests. But when you rest and trust him by faith that he will accomplish what you cannot, and God works. He does greater things than you could have ever imagined because you're taking the problem to him instead of trying to figure it out all on your own. And the more you trust him with it, and the more you rest and stay at peace, and you're not gonna get all worked up, and you're not gonna get bothered, and you're not gonna freak out, and you're not gonna get bitter, and you're not gonna get angry, and you're not gonna fight back, and you're not gonna, not gonna, you're just gonna rest because he's gonna take care of it. When this is your posture, God does great things. But when your posture is, man, I got to solve this problem, God goes, okay, go for it. I'll let you run right at that. Let me know when you're done trying. <laughs> and I'll come solve your addiction. Let me, let me know when you're done trying and I'll come solve your career issue. Let me know when you're done trying and I'll solve your marriage problem. Let me know when you're done trying and I'll solve because when we work, he rests, but when we rest, he, which would you prefer, God to work or you to work? Which leads me to the question I wanna ask tonight. How might your life be better if you just created space? How might your life be better if you just created space? What if you worked fewer hours? For some of you, maybe, maybe you should just work from home. Some of you can, you just don't do it. What if you worked from home? What if, what if you worked a few hours? Uh, this is it was so funny because uh, we were at this, this, with this group of pastors a couple weeks back and I was talking with probably, I think, one of the most influential pers- pastors in the world and I said to him, I said, so tell me about your schedule and he goes, oh, my family and I, we eat all three meals t- together every day. I was like, what? Like his kids too. They eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner together. And I'm like, wouldn't you get more accomplished if you just stayed at work and he goes, look at what God has accomplished. And he put me in my place so fast, I was like, what if you worked less hours and said, I'm just gonna go home. I'm just, I'm just going home. What if you scheduled less activity? One of the things that our, our family did um, with work hours was there was a time in which we said, you know what, we're gonna be home by 6.30 every day. I don't care what the problem is. I don't care what the struggle is at work. We're gonna go home at 6.30. We're gonna make ourselves a really good meal. We're gonna sit around as a family. We're gonna talk as a family and discuss uh, our lives. We're just gonna hang out. And it was beautiful. It started to correct my overwork aholicness. Just by, by faith, I went home. When it comes to scheduling less activity, one of the things we did with our kids when we sat them down and said, we really know you want to be in every sport and you want to be at all these plays and you want to do all this activity and you want to be in this ballet thing and you want to do that thing, but you get to pick one a year. Just one. So you're not going to let them play baseball, football, and soccer? No. I think they'll probably be more balanced if they choose one and they enjoy some time with their family. Space. What if you did I, I'm not telling you to do that, but what if, you, what, what if you schedule less activity? I don't know what that looks like. Do you have to say yes to everything that somebody asks you to do? Do you have to go to that wedding? Do you have to? No. Do, oh, oh, oh. do you have to go to that birthday party? No. Do you have to go to that baby shower? No. Who's making you go? You. And then you're overstressed and you're overworried and you're overtired and you're mad at them because you had to go to their stupid baby shower. Why are they having another kid? <laughs> That's what you're thinking while you're around sitting around eating cake. 
It's just true. So send them a gift and say no. You don't have to do everything. So what if you scheduled less and said, you know what, we're going to have a life. Are you hearing me? How about what if you connected less electronically? This was, the, oh, this is, I love Twitter. Anybody else like, like Twitter? It's like this, I know it's Elk River, but <laughs> I, like, I, I hate Facebook. I'm not on Facebook. It, it annoys me. But I love Twitter. I love, like I, just, like, I connect with people on Twitter. All my friends are on Twitter, so I'm like back and forth, and we're having conversations. And I like, like, I'm on Twitter a lot. And then I'm sitting around at home, and I'm da-da-da-da-da on my phone, and my kid is trying to say something in this ear, and Kelly's trying to talk to me over there, and all of a sudden, I'm caught. Is this helping my relationships? No. So we're going to try and experiment, her and I. We're gonna, when we walk in the house at night, we're going to put our phones in a basket, and we're not going to touch them until the next morning. <laughs> 30 days, we're going to try this. I'm going to die. <laughs> but I would like more time with my family. They are more valuable than anybody I will connect with. What if you connected less electronically? What if you spent less money? I bring this up because we, we do an offering at this church, you know, like when the talk is over, there's a time for offering, and then all of us feel guilty, or a lot of us do. We sit here and go, ah, I wish I could give. You're good people, you wanna give. I know it, I have conversations about this all the time. I wanna give, I wanna give, I wanna help, I wanna give, I wanna be a part of this. And I know that, and you feel bad. And the reason why we feel bad is because we've overspent so much, we don't have anything to give, and then we feel bad about it. So what if for 30 days, you spent less? Said, I'm not gonna buy that latte because I don't really need it, and I don't need to go through the McDonald's drive through because we actually get to go home and eat as a family because we don't have to be at that thing. And so uh, you have more space in your finances to do what you always wanted to do, which is be generous. And what about... Go ahead, put that up again one more time. And what if uh, you just said, I like this a lot. What if you said yes less? I bring this up because a pastor friend of mine, my pastor actually, my pastor came to me when we, our church was young and he said, he said to me, and like, I've never forgotten this, he said, every time you say yes, you're also saying no. Every time you say yes, you're also saying no. When you say yes to this activity, you're saying no to your family. Or to time with your spouse. How come you never have time for date night? Because well, I gotta do this and I gotta do this and we gotta do this and we gotta do this. You're saying yes to so much that your marriage suffers. Or your kids suffer. Or your health suffers. Because every time you say yes, you're also saying, come on. So what if you just started saying no? Let's practice. Everybody say no. no. Come on, say no. no. And you don't have to give people a reason. They say, well, well, maybe you, can you come to my, can, can you come to our, 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 our wedding? No, I can't do that. Well, why? I just, I just can't. Any reason you give them isn't going to work for them. So why give them one? It's your life. Do you want other people to run your life or do you want to run your life? Are you hearing me? See, the truth is, you get to have the life you'll say yes or no to. If you say yes to everything, you're never going to have a life. But when you learn to say no, you will start to live. The priorities, the things that you care about, the things you love most, those activities will start to become a part of what you get to do because you said no to what you thought you had to do. See, I believe at the cross, God freed us from the law of work six and rest one. So with that thought in mind, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put a challenge in front of you. I put it on every single one of those note sheets. I'm gonna put it up on the screens. I want you to see it. And uh, here's what I am hoping. I'm hoping as a church, we try something crazy for four weeks. Space. So for the next four weeks, I will seek to create more space for living by working fewer hours, scheduling less activity. And I'm gonna stop for a second because I know some of you, you're like, well, I don't even have a job right now. It's okay. I bet your life is still scheduled way too much. 
Even when you're not working, it seems like you're working. It's a full-time job not to work. So what if you worked fewer hours, scheduled less activity, connected less electronically, and spent less money? Why? So you could hear Christ more. So you know, go back to the story we started with. Who was hearing Jesus, Mary or Martha? Oh, Mary was hearing Martha. Was she busy or relaxed? Relaxed. It's interesting. God says in, in, in Psalms, be still and know that I am God. It doesn't say be busy and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. If you want to know God better, what do you have to be? Still. still. It takes space. Why? Why do I want to do this? Because I want to give grace more. I want, to, I want to be generous with my resources and kinder towards other people. And I want to feel grace more. And I think this is what I'm really, I want to, like the, the generosity part is good and the hearing God is good. But I think this is what I'm really after. And that's this. I want you to feel grace more. I want you to feel more at peace about your life and good about yourself. You can't feel good about yourself when all you're doing is stressing over everything. But when you're trusting him and you're resting and you're at peace saying, no, 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 I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna worry about that. I'm not gonna struggle with that. I'm gonna let God take care of this, this financial issue. I'm gonna let God take care of, of this work issue. I'm gonna let God take care of this school issue. I'm gonna let God take care of whatever the deal is. I'm gonna let him take care of it. When you trust and rest and live at this place, where God already gave you. He gave you this spot at the cross. If you would just live there, you know how much better you'd feel about yourself? There's an interesting thing about gratitude. When you're at the beach, and you're sitting here like this, all of a sudden you are just so grateful. You start going, God, thank you that I could be here. Thank you that you would do this for me. Thank you for adjusting my schedule so I could relax a little bit. Thank you. And like the, the, the thank you words start to come out of your mouth so freely and easily. I would tell you that your life would be filled with gratitude and thanksgiving and encouragement and joy and peace and blessing. If you would rest and let Christ take care of the work. I'm gonna pray in a second, but here's what I'm hoping that you'll do. If that's a commitment that you're willing to make, you're gonna try it for four weeks. You're gonna try something radical with your family. And I, it could be different for each of you. I just want you to sign that little card at the bottom of it. Like, you're gonna keep it yourself. You're gonna keep it yourself for four weeks. Some of you are like, I don't even know what to do with this yet. It's okay, because the next three weeks, we're gonna to talk to you about the how and the why and what this looks like. All I wanted to do was give you the concept this weekend. And we're gonna take it from a concept to a lifestyle. A lifestyle. I want this church to be known as the church where people just walk in joy and peace. I've never seen that before. So next week, Pastor Kelly's gonna talk and he's, she's gonna explain a little further with this. And the week after that, we're gonna take it a little further. And the last week, I'm gonna wrap it up by talking to you about how your future is gonna be better. How if the more space you create in life, the more creative you will become and the more destined for greatness you will be. That's what we're gonna talk about over the next four weeks. I hope you come back next week. I'm gonna pray and we're gonna be done. Jesus, I just pray right now for every life at all of our campuses that we would reject the concept that busy is better and we would move to a place of trusting you with our problems, with our worries, with our issues, and that we would live in a permanent state of rest, in joy, like our vacations feel. Help our tonight to feel this and our tomorrow to feel that way. Help us to walk into work 
bleeding vacation all over everybody else. Help us to walk into school not stressed out about the test, not worried about the assignment, because we know the favor of God's on us. We know we're going to be just fine. We know it's going to be good. Help us to work from our place of rest. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Everybody said, amen.